Support for Headline Humboldt is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up next on Headline Humboldt, the Board of Supervisors this week voted to put a 1% sales and use tax on the November ballot to raise money for road maintenance. Also, we sit down with Jamie Doyle and Carrie Donahue from Humboldt Soups On, a new grassroots nonprofit dedicated to feeding Arcadus homeless, about how they simply decided they were ready to make a difference. Coming up now on Headline Humboldt. From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. In an age dominated by the inflation of egos across the board and a resulting obsession with what we all think all the time, it's truly a rare thing in politics when someone makes a decision based on what's right. As a nation over these past several months, we've been careening toward what seemed like a bleak choice between two old men who were absolutely convinced of their own worth and of the dearth of talent to be found anywhere else. They weren't identical by any means. Their respective plans for this country were absolutely different in countless ways. Yet both candidates promised a presidency that would have been rooted in the same generational points of view, aging perspectives that have only grown more out of step in recent years with the views shared by many, many Americans. In the face of those facts, and likely considering his own slowly deteriorating performance, as well as the increasingly obvious opposition from folks in his own party, President Joe Biden this past week decided to forego re-election and pass the baton to a younger Democratic candidate. He has endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris, and though the party has yet to choose, it seems very likely that the nomination will be hers for the taking. We'll see how the politics turn out. We'll all soon be inundated, more than we already are, with election coverage and the resulting avalanche of memes and diatribes that have come to define public discourse today. But I wanted to take a moment to appreciate Biden's act of bowing out and moving aside for the good of his country. It takes a certain kind of person to seek the presidency and to believe that they, among hundreds of millions of Americans, are the best suited to lead. Such confidence can't help but border on arrogance. And as we've often seen, such an ego will almost never willingly accept anything less than absolute supremacy. Not Joe Biden. He could have kept fighting. He would have won the Democratic nomination and very likely could have won four more years as the most powerful human being on the planet. His opponent was of similar age, so the contrast wasn't at issue, and he'd already raised millions of dollars to fund his re-election. Instead, he heard the chorus of voices asking for new leadership, fresh perspective, and so made a decision for the good of everyone else. With this act, he cemented his legacy as a public servant who absolutely put his duty before his pride. I applaud him for setting that kind of example in this moment of rabid politics and an uncertain future. Way to go, Joe. Now, the news. The Humboldt County Board of Supervisors on Tuesday voted unanimously to place a 1% sales and use tax before voters in November. The proceeds from this new levy would go primarily toward addressing the sad condition of many county roads, which, according to staff, suffer from hundreds of millions of dollars in deferred road maintenance. Staff pointed out to the board that over the past three decades, the state government has repeatedly redirected funds away from local governments, including some $500 million in property tax revenues. Assistant County Administrative Officer Sean Quincy told the board that last year alone, those redirections cost the county $25 million. As natural disasters become more and more common due to climate change, the lack of road funds has become a critical issue. The proposed tax will need to be approved by 50% of voters plus one to pass. Polling numbers, meanwhile, have indicated high levels of support. As with Measure Z, this new tax will be overseen by a committee made up of regular citizens to ensure the county follows through on promises made. The ballot language did include public transportation as one potential expenditure of the generated revenue. You know, there's an old adage, right? Uh, an ounce of prevention or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I think that's exactly what we're looking at here. Uh, according to state data, um, the average car owner is spending $900 a year on car repairs, tires, rims, shocks, you name it, due to the poor condition of roads. $900 a year on average. Um, and I think we all know that when you get a brand new set of tires and you hit a big pothole, there goes your rim or there goes your alignment, suddenly you're spending more money. 
So I think um, the polling data shows this very clearly when it went up to 70% support, likely support for road improvements, road maintenance, and all these kinds of things. So that really helps validate that. I just wanted to thank you for including bus services in uh, in the um, language of the ballot measure, and I think that that really aligns with what we saw in the uh, in the polling too, and um, and some of the. Um, interest and support we've heard from the community. There are people who rely on those bus services, um, and it's clear that um, folks polled really thought that um, you know low-income individuals and uh, people living with disabilities um, and seniors in particular were, were top of mind for, uh, and, and kids using the bus to get, public bus to get to and from school, which is a reality for many um, youth, particularly high schoolers in our community. So I just really appreciate that, um, and I think that you know that makes perfect sense, and I'll continue to support that. Um, it's also consistent with our regional transportation plan um, and the goals that are set there, regional targets for um, increasing transit trips and reducing vehicle miles traveled. So I just want um, folks in the public to know that that's you know on our minds as we're um, considering this language, and um, and you know it's. Um, I, I can also say that you know I I lived in Petrolia when um, when the Wildcat slid out in 2006. <laughs> I'm sure Tom remembers that fondly, um, and it was scary. I was really poor at the time, and I really needed to get to town um, for basic goods and services, um, and I didn't have the opportunity to live elsewhere um, at that time in my life. So I you know I my heart goes out to folks who are in that situation as well. So I, I think this um, strikes a good balance between those needs and just want to appreciate that um, there's been a lot of robust community conversation. I think we do have some things to work out as we move forward with this and um, but we we're committed to investing the time to continue those conversations and make um, good collaborative decisions. The Humboldt Transit Authority is an extremely effective and efficient agency, and it provides critical service that a lot of folks uh, enjoy riding, including me. Um, but for an agency that serves such a large county, it has a small budget. Every year, as you heard, riders report unmet tra transit needs to the agency, and every year many of them can't be met either because there's not enough funding or because there's strings attached to that funding. HTA's budget is almost entirely state and federal funds, and that funding has conditions. Uh, it could easily be cut in a tough budget year or under an unfriendly administration, and both of those things are very real prospects, I think we can see right now. So if we really value transit service and if we want to respond to those local needs uh, and if we want to make sure that we keep providing transit uh, going into the future and that we keep our promises to increase and improve it, we really need that reliable and significant source of local funding. So I want to offer my sincere thanks both to supervisors and staff for the fact that transit service is included in the ballot measure language and also that transit representatives will be included in the work group to recommend how the money gets spent. It's critically important that you follow through on those promises and dedicate a substantial proportion of the revenue to transit if the measure passes. Thank you. Thousands of acres in eastern Humboldt County continue to burn as part of the Hill Fire, leading to a number of mandatory evacuations out of the Willow Creek area. The Hill Fire began on July 16th when a series of lightning strikes ignited forests in the Mosquito Creek drainage. More than 2,000 fire personnel have been directed to the scene, including 12 helicopters, 134 engines, and 61 separate crews. The fire is now at 7,100 acres and is 14% contained. Five people have been injured so far. A community meeting that was to be held this past Wednesday at the Willow Creek Bible Church was canceled. Cal Fire has set up an incident management base camp at Redwood Acres on Harris Street in Eureka, resulting in the closure of that portion of the road. For more information on evacuations and whether you or anyone you know is at risk, visit HumboldtSheriff.org slash emergency. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm David Gordon, Executive Director of Keat TV. And I want to tell you about the free PBS app. And it's not like free for 30 days or a three month trial. It's free for as long as you'd like to use it. Watch episodes of PBS shows that have premiered on TV recently, as well as Keat's live broadcast, right in the app, no antenna required. Shows like Frontline, PBS NewsHour, and Washington Week are always free. But you can get even more out of the PBS app by becoming a sustaining member of Keat. 
$5, $10, $20 a month, any of those options will qualify you for our most popular member benefit, PBS Passport. Drama, science, nature, there's so much to watch with Passport. But what really matters is your donation now supports the PBS programs that you watch. Thank you. Welcome back to Headline Humboldt. Joining us now in studio is Jamie Doyle and Carrie Donahue from Humboldt Soups On. Thank you ladies for joining us. Hi. Thanks for having us. So uh, you guys reached out to me and pitched the story and um, after a relatively brief conversation, I thought this is actually a fantastic story. Um, you guys, you and Jan Carr are the co-founders or did yes. Jan start it by herself? No, me Both and you? Jan Carr, yes. Okay. Um, decided that you wanted to make an immediate difference on an issue that is plaguing Humboldt County and right. the rest of California. So let's start with uh, the broad picture. What is Soups On and how did it come to be? Well, I volunteered to um, feed feral cats for Jan. Jan does that all over Humboldt County. She traps and spays and neuters and releases the cats. That's, that's public service right there. I mean, yes, that's a huge problem. yes. Yeah. And then she continues to feed them for the rest of her life. So she has yeah. an army of people out there feeding feral cats, mm -hmm. and I'm one of them. Yeah. And I started out in Valley West, and it was very near an encampment of folks who had no services. There's no help for food or housing or shelter of any kind out there. And it's a long way from any f services for food. We noticed they were eating out of garbage cans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of them are fl what they call flying signs to get money for food. Mm -hmm. um, and with the sign saying, give us, if you have cash, Yes, change, kind of yes. Like and so I just started feeling funny about feeding cats with these hungry people. And it was really weighing on my heart and Jan's as well. And I just said, what do you think if I make a pot of soup? I can make a big pot of soup <laughs> and we'll go out and just say, hey, you want soup? And that's what we did. And she said, great, I will be there with you. And I will talk to them about getting their dogs spayed and neutered. And that first time we fed 25 people, it was November 9th of 2023. Mm -hmm. And um, then we just started, said, we'll come back next Sunday. And before you knew it, I'd say within six weeks, we were serving every day. Wow. Now, so was, was Facebook immediately a part of that? Program, yes. Or so how did that evolve? Jan is incredible at networking and, you know, feeding these cats all these years and doing that work. She already had an army of people helping her with that. Yeah. So she started asking for donations and does anybody want to join? Does anybody want to cook? might you serve? What can you do? Yeah. That became our whole philosophy. Instead of being overwhelmed by the problem, the problem with homelessness is just say, ask yourself, what can I do? Yeah. And so before you knew it, so many people were volunteering and calling and we're training them, and it just all came together. It was really quite magical. Yeah, and now you guys have got a pretty sensible team together, right? 35. We've 35 got 35 volunteers. volunteers. Wow. We have cooks, we have servers, we have bakers, um, we have helpers. Yeah. And then Jan and I, Jan is what we call our animal liaison. Mm -hmm. So she's partnered with Redwood Pals. Okay. So we can get them vaccinations, get them spayed and neutered. And, um, and then I am kind of the people liaison. Yeah. I've grown to develop relationships with all these folks out there that we serve to add more of a personal touch, yeah. as well as I kind of manage all the volunteers. So, I mean, the, the administrative role, because I mean, I know that yes. starting and running a nonprofit is not a simple. No, it is not. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> setting up the nonprofit is a lot of legalities and yes. jumping through hoops and that sort of thing. Yes. And so there needs to be someone dedicated to that, yes. that process. Yes, that's my so, job. So, Carrie, um, you're mm -hmm. also on the team. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to be involved in Humboldt Soups On and what draws you to this kind of service? Well, I've always wanted to help in some way and have an impact. Uh, couldn't really find anything uh, right away after moving here three years ago, but came across Soups On on Facebook and thought this is something that I could do. So I contacted Jamie and she had my husband and I come out just to see how things worked. 
And we looked and we was like, well, gosh, uh, we can do this. So my husband cooks, um, I do everything else. Yeah. And uh, my son and I, we go out f every Friday wow. and uh, serve soup. Mm -hmm. It is, it's a way uh, to have a direct impact right away. Yeah. Because uh, when you're feeding someone, uh, they feel it. Because when we make this soup, when we make these meals, we're putting love and compassion and empathy. And when we're serving it to the people, they feel it. And you can see it in their faces. You can see that they're relieved, that they're able to eat. Because sometimes that's their only meal yeah. in that day. Now, as a parent, what do you think the value is of, you know, for you showing your kids a life of service um, early on in their lives? How do you think that'll help them develop as givers themselves? I think it's, uh, there's a, it's an immeasurable impact with children. I learned early on, my father was in the Red Cross his entire career, so I've been around this type of service all my life. And my kids have also been around service. We were in scouting. Uh, all the way through uh, kindergarten, through high school, my, both of my kids. I was a troop leader, um, and then we went on to do other things around. But when we moved up here, we were able to f luckily find soups on. And it just carries through. And also, I think we're, we're impacting people that might drive by, that see us every day, and maybe wonder, well, what, you know, I see these people every day. What are they doing? I don't know if we've gotten any volunteers that way, uh, but certainly we're p putting a good face on what's happening with the homeless, at least from our perspective. Yeah, and what I find particularly powerful about this story is seeing a need and not, you know, uh, whining about it. Not that, not that there's anything wrong with complaining about these issues, but taking action and right. making a real difference on a lot of people's lives really quickly. Right. Um, I think it proves you know, your organizational skills as well as Jan's, but then also the generosity of the community to get involved and want to do this. I think you uh, struck a chord with a, a lot of people. Which yes, I think a lot of people, most people, want to help, but they don't know what to do. I was one of those people, you know, and then it just, that simple question, what can I do, yeah. you know? And I think other people really bought into that too because they volunteer, they um, donate money, they donate food and goods. Yeah. You know, if all they can do is donate a can of beans, they donate a can of beans and they feel good about that's being turned into something immediately to feed people. Yeah. So there's so many different ways that you really can make a difference. Yeah. Um, if people wanted to give to the organization or to help you know, with food or whatever else, how can they go about doing that? I mean, searching Humboldt Soups on, on Facebook. Can you yes, that? you can learn a lot about us there. We also have a website, HumboldtSoupsOn.com, okay. and we have a PayPal that okay. they can make donations on PayPal. Okay. Um, also on Humboldt Soups on, on Facebook and Instagram, um, we have addresses and things where they can drop off goods okay. if they'd like to drop off, if they'd like to donate goods. Yeah and also different ways that they can donate money or volunteer. Now you guys have made amazing progress from becoming a nonprofit to uh, moving into a commercial kitchen, which mm -hmm. is a part of the legalities of, of, of this situation. And then uh, you have f future plans. Where do you guys see yourselves growing over the next few years? Do you think you have the momentum to keep it going? And what would you like to see happen? Absolutely, we have the momentum to keep it yes, going. Yes, absolutely. And um, I envision food trucks, like you know the taco trucks and things. Mm -hmm. Only we would be serving soup, and we would go be going to areas where a lot of the unhoused folks hang out. Yeah. So we'd be looking at those areas like Valley West, where it's hard for them to get services. Where the high traffic areas, where there's not a lot of like county offices or that kind of right, thing. Right, yeah. right, yes. Mm -hmm. Now you're also a social worker, correct? I am a social worker and I was also born into poverty yeah. and that I've been working with women and children who live in poverty pretty much all of my adult life through Head Start and early Head Start programs. Yeah. Um, what opened the door for me to do this is I was in a car accident in February of 2023 yeah. and I herniated a couple discs in my neck. So I've been on and off of work ever since. It did open up a lot of time for me, yeah. um, but my, my abilities are limited. 
I can't really lift much. Um, I can't do a lot of repetitive hand movements, but I can cook soup. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You found a way to be useful I did. to more than people I than just did. yourself. Yeah, and now I'm pretty much the schmoozer. <laughs> <laughs> so real quick, I mean, what are the, what, what do you guys typically serve when you go out? I mean, you're out there every day, which yes. I think people, we need to we be clear. We started are, yeah. out with um, soup and bread. Mm -hmm. um, now we have soup, homemade soups, excellent. We have excellent cooks. Mm -hmm. Homemade soups, we have bakers who bake in their homes. They bake both breads and desserts. Mm -hmm. So they get homemade, freshly baked bread and dessert every day along with the soup. Mm -hmm. And we do serve Kool-Aid, which they love. <laughs> and you know, it's I know it's sugar and that's not good for you, but they need the calories. Sure. So that's one of the reasons we serve that. It's inexpensive, they love it, it keeps them hydrated and also gives them some extra calories. Yeah. Now, Carrie, back to you a little bit. I mean, as in our community and communities up and down the state, we've been struggling with this problem of a uh, high homeless population that's only getting worse because property values are skyrocketing throughout the state. But I mean, I think a lot of times there's a misunderstanding about who makes up the homeless and what kind of situations they're in. A lot of judgment takes place. If you could you know, encapsulate what you've learned through this experience mm -hmm. and what you brought to it in terms <coughs> of the homeless, what would you say people need to know about these people and what they've gone through? That these people are no different than you or I. They have parents, they have grandparents, they have aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters, they have pets, they have interests, they have hobbies, they had lives before they became this, had this situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things happen to them that they could not control. Sometimes they had control over some things that happened, but in any case, uh, we approach them with no judgment. We understand that there was that saying, there but the grace of God, mm -hmm. yeah. go I. Uh, I have personally, um, when I started serving, it was like removing the veil. Uh, when, I, when one sees a homeless person out on the street, you, you, see, you might see a person, but it's more like you see a thing. This is a homeless person yeah. with all of the preconceived ideas you may have, your biases. But when you take the time to actually meet with them, mm -hmm. deliver some service to them, it changes and yeah. it changes you. Yeah. Uh, you see them as a person, as a whole person, and it makes such a difference. Yeah, it kind of restores their humanity from your perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I'd like to add to Please, that is, yeah. um, I, working with children, women and children who live in poverty, one of the hardest things about that job is seeing the ones that fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And they fall through the cracks because we don't have much of a social net, safety net for folks. And I see these people as those children who fell through the cracks. Yeah. This is where they mm -hmm. end up because there wasn't help. There wa they weren't able to receive the help that they needed. Yeah. And, and so you're kind of, seeing them on the other end of that process I and am. trying to help them there as well. I am. Yeah, that's fascinating. Also, I mean, we were talking a little bit before the show about boundaries. And like, it, I imagine that when you're serving food like this, a lot of times people might have the urge to confide in you or tell you their stories, mm -hmm. which could be fascinating, but also that's not something that you necessarily want to encourage too much because that could turn into an unhealthy relationship between you and the people that you're serving, Right, correct? right, yeah. and we've learned as we've grown um, about boundaries. Me being a social worker, I have very firm boundaries, but a lot of my, we call us our each other soup ladies. A lot of our <laughs> soup ladies and one soup man, um, <laughs> you know, aren't, aren't used to having those kinds of boundaries. So we've really had to put it down in writing. Yeah. We're friendly, not friends. Yeah. You know, we really care about them. But if we take on too much, we won't be able to go for the long run because it will be overwhelming. Sure. So I always say keep your eye on the ball and the ball is to feed them and to keep feeding them. Yeah. And if you find yourself being bothered by other things, just go right back to this is our job. Yeah. And in order, in order to be sustainable, we have to focus on that and just feeding them. Well, that's the thing you have to decide about priorities. If you, right. you can help one person a lot or a lot of people with one of their most important needs, which yes. is food. And yes. that's the route you guys 
seem mm -hmm. to have chosen and bless you for it. Um, one of the things that I noticed with you guys is that you help these folks take care of their animals and also, you know, uh, help ameliorate the wild pet problem of spaying and neutering and that sort of thing. There's a lot of judgment from the community about homeless people who have pets. I've always thought that if they don't have companionship, if they don't have a home, having a pet is sometimes the only thing that might be keeping them sane or out of jail or a lot of things. Right. But can you talk a little bit about your guys' approach to sort of being inclusive of the pet and the value of the relationships that you see among the homeless folks oh, with their pets? Oh, yeah. Their pets are so important. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, the majority of them are very, very well taken sure. care of. Yeah. They'll, they'll put them, their pets before themselves. Um, we do feed them. We feed the dogs as well as some cats. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they, I can't even express how much they love their animals and how important it is to them. And for some of them, that's all they have. That's their family. That's who they sleep with. That's yeah. who keeps them warm yeah. and protected and safe yeah. because, yeah, it's kind of scary out there. Even for them, you know, many of them have been out there for many, many years. Yeah. But their things are being stolen all the time. I mean, they're yeah. very vulnerable. So pets, especially dogs, are really crucial. Yeah, their early warning system, their protection if it needs to be, there, mm -hmm. there are a lot of different things that most people who live in a home and take care of the dog don't consider, but the dog can actually take care of you. And that's yes. why, you know, early man and you know, dogs around the fire, there was a relationship there because it was mutually um, serviceable. And I think that that yes. continues today. And, and our partnership with Redwood Pals, um, has been really awesome. They come out every Tuesday and talk with everyone and vaccinate if needed. And I would say we've got about 50% of all those dogs spayed and neutered at this point from the beginning of last November. At first, no one was open to spay and neuter. They all said, absolutely not. Yeah. And But we've built trust with them. We have mm -hmm. a relationship with them now. So it's opened their minds and opened the door to doing that. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. We're out of time. I appreciate you guys coming in and telling us your story and setting an example for the community about how to be of service to our fellows. And um, so thank you for that. If people want to support you, they can go to Facebook, look for Humboldt Soups On. Yes. And then the website is HumboldtSoupsOn.com. Dot com. Yes. And uh, they have a story to tell and some uh, photos to look at. And you can see where their needs might be for what you can, what you can give. But that's it for this evening. Remember that this show is made possible through the support of viewers like you. And if you want something interesting to consider, an opportunity to ponder what's really at play on this planet and across the universe, visit youtube.com slash at Neon Galactic to enjoy some truly cosmic conversations. Stay tuned, stay informed.